Ooh, static works. It's dry up here. I don't know if you've heard that. Um, so we're a little bit early, but um, we're just sitting here and thinking that you guys got here early, and uh, maybe you're checking your Twitter streams, but I thought I could also share a story of a recent um, customer attack um, to set the mood for the importance of monitoring and the role of, of monitoring in uh, site operations. Um, so this particular customer um, was running a Drupal site, of course, uh, and they noticed that they were getting a lot of reports about spam coming from their domain. Um, and it just kind of all spiked on, uh, I forget what day it was, it was January, some day in the middle of January, and they thought, okay, what's going on that could be leading to a lot of spam reports coming from our domain? Um, and we, we started to dig in, dig in, dig in, and noticed that, that there was an extra PHP file that was getting called a lot inside of their files directory. Um, so we did more and more investigation into that uh, and found that the file was uploaded at a particular time. Um, the refer request for the file upload comment, uh, command came from a Google search for um, sites that had the PHP input format available to anonymous users. Um, so that led us to thinking about it. We saw where that request ended up and found a particular form on the site unrelated to the input format system. Um, so this uh, custom module was avoiding the permissions associated with input formats to allow PHP execution for anonymous users. Um, so a pretty interesting situation, and I think it's uh, um, you know, pretty uh, illustrative of what can happen to your site and how monitoring for spam coming out could be an indication of an arbitrary code execution vulnerability somewhere else in the site. Um, so how, how many people want to admit to having that happen to them? One honest guy, good job. <laughs> Thanks very much. I was glad Greg wasn't looking at me when I raised my hand, so, <laughs> so I was, I'm with you, whoever was out there before, but maybe, maybe the moral of the story is buy the book. If you're going to be writing custom Drupal modules, you should buy the book on Drupal security by our friend Greg here. Thank you. Um, well, welcome, everybody. We're so excited to be here. I hope all you hackers have gotten your afternoon coffee so that you're all as full of energy and looking forward to talking about keeping the lights on, on operations and monitoring best practices as we are up here. Um, we're certainly excited about this talk. We believe that this is the fun part of websites. Certainly, the design and the UI and UX are so much fun, and they're super critical. But that's not the part we're focused on today. We're focused on the infrastructure part. Um, before I dive in, my name is Ned McLean. I'm the CTO and one of two co-founders of Applied Trust here in, up here in sunny Boulder, Colorado. Um, love being in the area, and it's fun to see all these smiling faces out here um, joining us in our beautiful state. I, in, at Applied Trust, we're an infrastructure company. We focus on, we do a lot of operations. We also do a lot of assessments, and we do a lot of architecture work. And being diverse in all those different areas means, I think, two things that are relevant to this talk. Um, one is that we just see a lot of environments, right? We see what the best practices are that are being done at hospitals and financial institutions and people that have to take care of really sensitive data. Um, we do a lot of work with power plants that are generating power and have to comply with the national standards for securing those, that national grid infrastructure. And so we have a an, an, you know, perspective to see what those very best practices are. If you had unlimited time and money, if security and availability and performance were your number one priority, how might you achieve those? We also work with startups and small organizations and nonprofits and government entities, and so we have a good pragmatic perspective as well. Um, and I guess that's the other part of being an operations company is we do carry a pager. Trent and I all carry pagers, and um, we're sort of the people that have to eat our own Wheaties. So while we'll be making recommendations up here for what we think are good best practices, we'll be trying to balance those with what's pragmatic, what's realistic to do. We all have features to get out there, websites and, and functional applications to launch, and we have to balance that with these aspects of, of operations. And so that's the, the perspective we're going to try to bring to that. Um, I brought two celebrity chefs along with me. We're going to tag in and out to try to keep this exciting for, the, for our little one hour we have together. And first, I'd like to introduce Trent Hein. As I mentioned, he's our, my co-founder at Applied Trust. We're celebrating our 10th year in business, something we're really proud of. Thank you so much. And you know, a couple of fun Trent stories is um, I think he has the, I know he has the distinct honor of on this stage being the person who has written the code longest ago that's still in use today. Um, and I don't know, I would ponder or postulate that perhaps he's, he's even that entity in this room. And that's back at UC Berkeley when he was a student, um, wrote a lot of the code contributing to the, to the BSD 
branch of Unix before, the, before Linux even existed, and specifically to the mTree code. Thank you, Trent. <laughs> Woo, good contribution. <laughs> The other two quick things I wanted to say about Trent is um, he's certainly one of the initial, one of the people that have handled the very first internet security incident ever. Back in 1988, the Morris Internet worm broke out and infected something like 80 or 90 percent of the internet. Granted, the internet was a lot smaller, but still it was a tremendous infection. It's certainly the first global internet security incident of its kind ever. And Trent at CU Boulder was one of the team of engineers that, di that did the forensic analysis to determine how the worm was spreading, what ports and services were vulnerable, and how to shut those down to try to get the internet back online. And that didn't happen in a matter of minutes, it was a matter of days to get the internet back. And so that was a, a, a legacy experience he brings to, a perspective he brings to this talk today. And Trent's involved today in the community a lot. He's involved um, at CU Boulder in the CS, uh, the computer science department there helping to establish curriculum for the next generation of computer science people. So I'm really excited to have Trent here. Also here is Greg Nadison, who, who if you have ever spent any time on Drupal.org, it's hard to know where to start to comment on Greg. You'll see Greggles, his, his user ID, all over the place. And that's contributions from stuff like documentation and process. And gosh, he's always on the forums saying, hey, maybe here's a better way to handle that really snarky response you just gave to this new user. And he's like the most patient forum person, but he's also super, super technical, right? If every day most of us use the path auto module to make our URLs look really sexy for the users and search engines out there, and Greg was the initial contributor of that module. So we really, every day we're using his code. On the other kind of end of the spectrum, um, I, was, I was recently using the PL upload module that allows you to drag and drop using HTML5 goodness, a whole bunch of images into your, your image CK field or whatever. And Greg was the original author of that module. So Greg has a ton of technical and hands-on experience with Drupal. Um, you know, one of the, Greg's also on the Drupal security team. So he deals with core vulnerabilities and contrib vulnerabilities with getting those notifications out there, with managing the processes around, you know, how do we get a responsible notification about a vulnerability? When do we disclose that to the public? How do we make sure people are applying the patches when we announce them? So a lot of, you know, both political and technical work there and, and brings a great perspective. He's also the co-founder of Growing Venture Solutions, GVS, and also of DrupalScout.com. Check out DrupalScout.com if you're looking for something to do during our talk. And now he's the Director of Security Services at Acquia. So, so Greg is certainly a big hitter in the, the Acquia field. Let's welcome Greg, or in the Drupal field, let's welcome Greg. Awesome, and you know, we have a, a good sized group today and only an hour, so if you have something that you're dying to say and you think it really impacts the group, please speak, speak up and we'll, we'll definitely holler at you. But if you wanna chat about this stuff or something specific to your site afterwards or online, um, we'll have our Twitter and email stuff at the end of this talk and of course we're on drupal.org. Um, quick roadmap, we're gonna split this into three sections, talk about monitoring, management, and measurement. We're gonna talk about security testing and monitoring and then ongoing operational security. And I have had, heard the comment, gosh, that's a lot of security content for an operations focused presentation. And I, I wanted to take a minute to say that, you know, that we're not doing this stuff, we as organizations or we as Drupal site managers and developers, we don't do this stuff because we're good Boy Scouts or to tell our friends that we're following the best practices and operations, right? The, the goal here is to take our resources, our limited human capital, and allow them to do the most useful stuff possible for our organization. And that useful stuff is not breaking, break fix stuff all day long. And there's a really well-known study out there from Microsoft, um, but it's a really great study of organizations that high-performing organizations that have good change control processes, have monitoring in place, they know what's happening in their organization, they're applying patches, they have those basic pro operational processes in place, they spend 20% of their time doing break fix, and 80% of their time doing projects and deploying new functionality and all that awesome love stuff that we love to do, right? And the other end of it is organizations that don't have that stuff spend 60 to 80% of their time doing break fix. And that's the stuff that makes us not like our jobs, right? Is dealing with, we got hacked, our site is slow, something is down, and that stuff will happen, but if it happens one fifth of our life instead of four fifths, we're gonna be happier people. And so the goal here is to put these things in place that make us more efficient, that allow us to focus on the fun stuff and not spend all our time dealing with patching and someone, what happened, what's in the logs. So this, that's, that's really the big picture goal here. Um, the, the story I just heard recently that I have to retell is about Paul O'Neill, the Treasury Secretary. 
And I guess in 1987, before he was Treasury Secretary, he took over as the CEO of Alcoa, the aluminum company, makes all the aluminum metal. Right? And they're a failing company. They have terrible quality problems. All the aluminum people, all the people that want aluminum are going overseas to get aluminum because Alcoa is not producing quality aluminum and their efficiency's down and their stock price is dropping. And Paul O'Neill comes in and instead of focusing on quality or efficiency or whatever, he says the number one thing we're gonna focus on is worker safety. We're gonna make sure that we have no accidents here at Alcoa. And these people are 60,000 people all pouring hot metal out of drums, right? It's not the safest place to, to be working in general. And he's like, we're gonna focus on safety. And the thing that happened out of that, that was a keystone habit for these people, that focusing on safety meant we had to follow our processes, right? If we're gonna double check something, we're gonna double check it every time. And if the temperature of something's gonna be X, we're gonna make sure it's that for safety reasons. But the outcome was that Alcoa exploded, right? In a time of industrial, you name it for America, Alcoa is actually a quite successful company right now, and also it's safer to work at Alcoa, at one of their 83 aluminum plants, than it is to work at a computer job where you type. You have less chance of getting a, a physical injury working at one of these Alcoa plants because they're so focused on safety. And so while we're gonna talk a lot about security, the point is that security stuff, that those best practices establish an environment where we have control, where we know that our site's not crashing because of missing patches, where we know that our site is stable and performant, and we know where the weak points are and where we need to focus when there's issues. So with that, let's dive into, or let's take a step back and look really quickly at, this, at the evolution of industry itself, and specific to pollution, right? Back at one time in America, smokestacks on the horizon in your city was a sign of progress, right? That was a sign of industry. This is the place to move. If you want an awesome job in a factory, come to the city, we've got smokestacks. And, and Greg offered up this awesome, to, to date, this is a recent photograph from a local, hyper-local site driven by Drupal here in, in the Denver area. And this photo on the top right, well, it's hard to see, um, the Denver Seal, which I'm sure you can Google, has a smokestack in it, right? So even Denver was, in to date, we're advertising, oh, look at this beautiful place. We have mountains and prairies and smokestacks. <laughs> and so, so there was a time when, Industry meant pollution, right? And that was okay. And then that's evolved, right? And that evolved first. The first big progression there was all these regulations from the EPA and, and regulations about emissions. It said, oh, you can only dump so much mercury into the river. And so everybody dumped as much mercury as they had into the river up to that level, right? And we've seen that evolution happen again, where now it's a marketing brand strength to say we're green, right? Toyota does it, and now their manufacturing costs are down, right? Because they're figuring out every piece of what it costs and where, where all their waste is, thinking about green, but as a side effect, they're super efficient and super productive. And so where are we at in the software industry, right? We're unfortunately not quite as evolved as the environmental industry. We're often, sadly, still in this state where people say, oh, websites just get hacked oh, my Microsoft Word just crashes, or my application just crashes, right? And people just accept that. And hopefully we're starting to evolve into this second phase, where now there's regulations, right? If you're gonna collect credit cards, no matter how big or small your company is, you have to be PCI compliant. And that means you have to have specific things around logging and passwords and basic security controls we should probably all be using anyway. And HIPAA, there's healthcare regulations. And so we're kind of in this middle stage, but we're certainly not as evolved as we are in the environmental world. And so, and you know, we can all say, gosh, the environmental world could be a lot better too. So what I'm trying to say with this is I think it's a super, super exciting time for us, right? We're right in the middle of this evolution. And as Dries said in his, his uh, opening keynote yesterday, awesome keynote, is Drupal's also in a state of evolution, right? And so we're right on top of this really dynamic, really exciting time. And as Drupal evolves, so must we. And so that's what, what hopefully the punchline is here. You know, Drupal, when it, at one time, maybe it, it was mostly focused on newsletters and community sites and things that where outages and where security incidents didn't have as big of an impact. And I've had the privilege of working recently on Drupal sites that are responsible for life safety, that are in use at hospitals and by governments to, to manage incidents when there's floods or other incidents like that. And I, certainly, we, many of us have worked on Drupal sites where the, the Drupal, where the, the business person stands over our shoulder and says, for every 10 minutes this site is down, I'm losing $23,000 or whatever. And so Drupal's evolving, right? It's awesome. It's becoming this new, powerful tool that people depend on for their business. It's no longer just a little luxury or a little internal intranet. This is something that many businesses depend on, and so we have to grow up a little. 
And a key ingredient in doing that is monitoring. So we're gonna talk a little about monitoring. Um, I love this quote from Brian Ellis that measurement is the link between math and science. Um, all too often we go into an organization and they say, oh, we just bought a brand new internet connection because our site was slow. And you're like, oh my gosh, you have these uncompressed images all over the front page. It's never gonna matter how fast your internet connection is. And I think the point is that measurement is critical. Um, where operational processes in general move us from the 80% of break fix to like the 20% of break fix. Monitoring specifically is focused on mean time to recovery. So in, in hospitals or enterprises where they have metrics around how often is my stuff up, what happens if it's down, I'm planning around that availability, they, mean time to recovery is a key metric for them. And it's, if we have an incident, how long does it take us to fix it? No one has zero incidents. So when we have an incident, whether that's the site is down or it's hacked or something's not working right, some function that the view's just broke and the site looks like crazy now, whatever that incident is, it's how long we take to fix it. And the trick to monitoring is, is taking that mean time to recovery and instead of 80% of that recovery time being figuring out what's broken, it's 20% of the recovery time is figuring out what's broken. And since we've shaved, show, shaven all that time off, right, we have less mean time to recovery overall, right? Their outages just last so much less. And so that's the point of monitoring. This is, the, I think, a key slide that, of messages I wanted to convey around monitoring. If you have an awesome monitoring system in place today, that's spectacular. If not, or if you have a monitoring system in place you're not sure about, these are characteristics of a monitoring system that I consider essential today. And this is certainly an evolving field. If you are on Twitter, you can see the hash, hashtag monitoring sucks. There's a whole community of people out there talking, you know, a little sarcastically about monitoring sucks, but about how to do monitoring. It is not an easy problem. And so it's certainly changing. And so here's some characteristics of some monitoring systems. If yours doesn't have that, there's some amazing vendors on the show floor that can introduce you to more powerful monitoring systems. And there's also some awesome open source systems that meet all of these requirements. So the first one is real-time and trend monitoring. Most people have real-time monitoring. My pager goes off if the site is down. The other half of that is capacity planning information. That's often where people say, Ned, my site is slow, come help me out. And I say, great, show me your CPU utilization and your memory utilization for the last month. And show me, you know, last week when you had that really slow site performance, show me what it looked like at that point. Was, was your disk busy? You know, how many requests per second were you getting? And while some of that might be available through Google, Google Analytics, most of that needs to be through your infrastructure monitoring system. And so that's the big difference. Lots of people, alert only, we need to be doing trend monitoring, seeing a graph of our measurements. Custom plug-in system. Whatever organ our organizations probably have really strong PHP programmers. Perhaps we have Python programmers or someone that loves to program in Perl, like I still do, or maybe a Bash scripting guru that's just Bash is the only thing they will use. If you have a monitoring system that has a proprietary plug-in system, that you have to write it in .NET or you have to write it in Fortran or whatever, you're gonna be very limited in who can contribute to your monitoring system. This is often the, the monitoring role is like relegated to someone, right? Oh, you're the, the new guy, so we're gonna make you do the monitoring and set it up. But really, we need the smartest developers and site builders to be figuring out what we actually need to be monitoring. Runs your functional tests. I'll talk about that in one slide. Active and passive monitoring. This is something we've lost from the days of the 80s when we had monitoring systems like HP's Network Node Manager, where the simple network management protocol was how devices sent reports back. They'd send alerts, oh, my network switch is going down, or my router is too busy. And we've really moved away from that to poll-based based monitoring, and I think that's a little bit of a loss. We need to look for a monitoring tool that supports a way to push alerts into it, whether that's an API or a command line tool, you name it. Log analysis we'll talk about on one side. Escalation is important for our quality of life, right? Today we should not have a monitoring system that just pages one person and doesn't support a complex rotational system and allow you to roll up to people if alerts aren't acknowledged. And then finally I'll talk about job execution briefly on a couple slides. This is like a graph of monitoring HTTP. And when I mention runs your functional tests, the one thing I wanna get out there as a tool is the name Selenium. If you don't have that tool in your tool belt, Hopefully you're using an even better commercial tool that's even better and more awesome. But if you're not, then Selenium's a tool we can all have in our tool belt. If we're a, a, just a tester and we're filling in forms, Selenium will automate that form filling in. But if we're building a view or a complex form API integration, um, Selenium will allow you to run through many steps of a web, website and give you that transaction back. So the point of this slide is if you're just connecting to a site and getting a, 
an, a 200 code back, that's probably not sufficient monitoring today. We need to use a, mon a monitoring tool that can run in a real browser and step through real browser steps, and Selenium's a good tool to have up your sleeve. I wanted to mention PageRank not because I care if, what your page rank looks like or even that much what mine looks like. I'm not an SEO person, but I think it's important to say that your monitoring tools are often siloed in the, for the DevOps or infrastructure sysadmin person. They know how to use it and they're adding monitoring, but the business should be adding metrics too, right? We can easily monitor page rank or number of subscribed users. And often you'll see organizations that have an awesome monitoring tool but it's myopic, it's only looking at that lower layer and we should be monitoring things that are relevant to the business too. Often like Greg said, oh all that spam mail going out, that's the red flag, right? Maybe the number of users going way down or way up in our system is a red flag that there's an issue. Um, the APC tool for, for PHP, um, a lot of us are using it and I wanted to call it out as an example of a component that's often overlooked in Drupal environments. So often, you know, this tool works 99% of the time and when it doesn't, you'll get an error like this. And that happens usually after you install more modules or something that's gonna require more RAM from APC that's not allocated there. And it's simple to have your monitoring system monitor this. I swear 99% of sites are missing it. So I wanted to try to point that out with a couple pretty charts. The other two or three things to keep in mind for monitoring are cron. You know, we're so used to running cron as either poor man's cron or from a cron tab in our Unix system. And I think that that's something for the, the previous generation that we need to move on. And, and what I'm specifically advocating is whatever your monitoring system is, it should be the thing connecting to your Drupal site and executing cron. And that gives you a lot of benefit that you don't otherwise have. Specifically, you can see how long your cron runs take, right? You might be able to dig through log files and infer some of that information, but by executing cron from a remote system, you can see how long the runs take, and if they fail, you get an immediate notification about that without digging through watchdog logs. Here's an example of a site where one of the cron jobs is failing and it certainly stands out. The last tool I wanted to mention in terms of monitoring is the Nagios module. The folks that have been working on the whitehouse.gov site contributed this module and it provides an open source way to see inside, not in, inside, your, monitor, inside your Drupal instance from any monitoring tool. Nagios is a good standard open source monitoring tool most tools can run Nagios plugins. And so it's worth considering this tool to tell you things like you have watchdog, er, you have errors in your watchdog log, or you have users who, who are, keep getting locked out, or you have dependency, mo module dependency errors that are causing something to be broken. So the Nagios module is worth knowing it's out there. Um, this is an example of a site where we can see dozens of different Drupal sites, each monitored through that Nagios module, right? It's, if we have one or two Drupal sites, it scales to have us log in and check it out every day, no problem. But if we have 200, we need to have some automated system and should have some screen like this. Greg's gonna talk about a couple other alternatives. Um, job automation and then logging are my last two topics. So job automation, um, Jenkins is the de facto standard for continuous integration or automating jobs like deploying to development, deploying to staging, de deploying to production. And really all Jenkins does is run command line scripts. Just runs bash or batch scripts that you've written, right? And I think the message here is that we should try to move towards scriptifying or codifying all of those system administration and deployment activities we do. If we can capture that in a script and commit that to Git or Subversion, then we have a repeatable deployment process. And Jenkins is a tool to look for if you're interested in learning more about that. Logging, super important stuff. The one thing I wanna say about logging is that you should consider turning on syslog logging. On a normal Drupal site, out of the box, it's logging to the database, but not to a text file anywhere. And if your site gets hacked, it's easy for a hacker to edit that database and remove specific entries. If it's written to a text file on that same server, debatably they could still do that. With the syslog tool, you can send logs remotely. If you're collecting credit cards or security is important to you, you should have some kind of centralized, off-server centralized logging system. Logging, so I, to end with my little section with a little Paris Hilton twist, I was just gonna say what is hot or not. Um, and this is just a summary of what we talked about. Ping or HTTP results code monitoring, not hot. What is hot is live user story testing and trend analysis through tools like Selenium. Um, what's not hot is poor man's cron or, or cron tabs for any job, even if it's not Drupal related, don't put it in the cron tab. Instead, run it from your centralized monitoring system so that you have a, a, way to, a window into that. Um, logging to the database only out, now we do logging to, to central host through syslog. 
Um, logging in to see Drupal errors on each site and if they need updates or not, that's not hot. But what's hot is a central Drupal management system like Greg's gonna talk more about. And finally, offsite backups. Um, yes, those are still important, but now we also need to be thinking about off-cloud backups. If your back data is only backed up in one cloud provider, you're probably missing the bus. I wanted to end, and I thank you guys, I wanted to end really quickly and say if this stuff seems daunting, like gosh, we can never go from zero to 60, no one can go from zero to 60. Don't try to eat the whole elephant. There's two pieces of advice I have. There's this great book called The Visible Ops Handbook. Visible Ops Handbook. And it has very simple steps for how you can get a handle on your environment. If you have outages all the time and don't know what's happening, this has some really good ideas. And then I would leave you with, if you don't have this monitoring stuff in place, instead of trying to tackle it all at once, every time you have something break, every time you have a client call or a developer or engineer discover something wrong, and like, why the heck, who changed this? Why is this broken or down? Add that to monitoring, just when there's issues. And you'll soon discover that you've got all your most critical pain points in monitoring. And with that, I will segue to my friend, Greg. Wow. I, um, I recommend to anybody, if you're thinking about giving a presentation, consider giving with Ned, because I love the introduction. Thank you so much. Um, so. Uh, Security testing and monitoring is my portion, um, and I broke it down into tools and services for detecting, responding to vulnerabilities and threats. Um, so just to, to describe those a little bit more, detecting is about finding the problem. Um, I think particularly with information security, this is such an important issue because, uh, you know, that example that the story that I started off with, if you don't know that your site is sending out spam, then, then you're being abused and you have no idea. If your credit card numbers that you're collecting from customers got stolen and you just don't know that that happened, um, then that's a huge problem that you can't begin to address. Uh, and so it's really important that you can detect things to find the problems. <laughs> And then responding. Um, I think all too often people come up with their response plan after an incident has happened. Um, so ideally what you wanna do is come up with this plan for response before the incident has happened and then when you're frantic and you're, you know, you're freaked out about what's going wrong, wrong, you'll be able to follow that response plan and, and try to keep a little bit more of a cool head um, that is, takes a measured response. Um, so vulnerabilities, those are the weaknesses inside of your site, whether or not you know about them. And then threats, those are all the ways that the bad guys are trying to get after you, uh, whether or not those are successful. Um, so to try to provide a framework for how we might think of the vulnerabilities, this is based on, anybody, anybody recognize it? Yes, what is it? Yes, so this is um, specifically the OWASP top 10. Um, and if you're not familiar with OWASP, I definitely recommend getting to know them. They have an event actually here tomorrow in Denver. So if you're um, a security nut more so than a, a Drupal nut, um, you may want to look at Snowfrock. Um, I, I'm not suggesting a competitor to DrupalCon, maybe. But, um, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty cool group. They also have local meetups and lots of great online resources. Um, so this is their top 10 set of vulnerabilities, the things that they think are the biggest threats to the web application world right now. Um, in, in the Drupal world, the ones that we have to worry about the most as site builders, module developers, themers, um, site owners, are the ones that I've highlighted in white. So injection, and that includes both SQL injection and uh, code injection, like arbitrary PHP execution. We just had a vulnerability in the CK editor modules that did that. XSS, this is the biggest problem in Drupal modules, Drupal sites, uh, is cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And it's approximately 50% of the security advisories that come out of Drupal.org are related to cross-site scripting. So a huge problem that we really need to uh, figure out some better solutions to. CSRF, or cross-site request forgeries, next, um, next one that we need to worry about. And I guess I'll, I'll just back up for a second. Um, broken authentication and session management. My sense here is that if you're using core, then you're probably okay on that. It's the kind of thing that is so important to sites that when Drupal gets audited, that's one of the things that the, the researchers will look into the most. Um, so as long as you're using a typical way of doing authentication and session management inside of Drupal, then you're probably in pretty good shape. If you're writing your own single sign-on tool or if you're using one of the lesser known single sign-on tools, um, then definitely you should be putting some of your own resources into looking into that. Um, insecure direct object reference. Um, this is one that uh, Drupal doesn't usually have a problem with and we, we manage this through um, a lot of different tools that, uh, so when we talk about this one, we don't talk about it this way, we talk about it more as access bypass. Um, and that is a growing issue in Drupal, um, but kind of at a, at a, in a different direction. 
so misconfiguration, again, going back to that story I told at the beginning, they had PHP available to the world. That was a, just a misconfiguration issue on their site. And it's something that's so easy to do in Drupal is just shoot yourself in the foot with checking off one more checkbox than you should have and giving people permissions that you shouldn't have. Um, insecure cryptographic storage. This is something that needs to happen at a different layer than Drupal. You know, this is about HTTPS. It's about using SSH when you're managing your server, using a VPN to encrypt all the traffic. Um, it's something that Drupal kind of lives inside of rather than having to worry about itself. There is one exception to that that I, I would say, which has to do with things like the password hash um, and if you need to encrypt information inside of your site. So if you're dealing with PII that you feel like you want to encrypt even though even when it's in the database, um, then there are some tools like the encryption module that can help you out with that. Um, failure to restrict URL access. So this is mostly related to the access bypass that I mentioned earlier. Um, so definitely a big problem that we need to worry about in Drupal. Um, insufficient transport layer protection. Again, this is something that's kind of outside of Drupal's realm of concern. Um, and then unvalidated redirects and forwards. We need to worry about that in Drupal. We have this fun Drupal go to function. Um, it's, it's, you know, it, it itself protects against this problem, but module developers can introduce problems um, if they're not using it properly. So how can we detect some of those vulnerabilities? Uh, there, I've broken this down into automated and manual, and then code reviews and penetration testing. Um, so if you're looking for a static automated code review, there's a couple different solutions. The coder module, secure code review module, uh, and Acquia offers that as a service. Um, not yet, it's on the roadmap, pardon me. Um, so dynamic automated code analysis, it's not a very common thing, although there are some, some experiments in that. Um, Barry Jaspin in particular worked on that a couple of years ago in his taint mode PHP. Um, so if you're interested in that idea, then uh, search for Barry and taint mode PHP. Automated penetration testing. So a couple of, um, one open source tool for this that, that I love is uh, Grendelscan, or that I think is interesting anyway, is Grendelscan. Um, and then some other famous proprietary tools like Fortify and Rational also provide that, um, although uh, they are quite expensive. Um, so a bit of a downside there. Drupal specific tools, uh, it's also on the Acquia roadmap. Um, things that we're, we're working at, on at Dr as Drupal Scout and are now part of the engineering process at Acquia. Um, and then, so manual things, what can you do? A manual code review, right? If you know Drupal best practices, you can look through the code and identify problems. Uh, here I have an example of a SQL injection problem in Drupal code. Um, so if you, if you don't know how to spot that, then um, look at the session from yesterday that's gonna be on video. Peter Wilhannon and Jacob Succi, they talked a lot more about how to do manual code reviews in Drupal. Um, and then manual penetration testing. This is kind of like, you know, your job is to just see if you can inject um, some, some code, look at different input fields that you have and see if you can manipulate those to get an, a response that the developers weren't necessarily intending you to get so that you can become an attacker. Um, some ways to automate that a little bit, there's the Vuln module, which is for Drupal 6, um, just begging for a port to Drupal 7. Um, and it automates the process of injecting JavaScript into a lot of different places. And then if you're using something like Firefox, I think a great kind of gateway drug into the world of manual penetration testing is the Tamper Data, mod or Tamper Data extension to Firefox, which is very user friendly for um, messing with the uh, HTTP responses and uh, requests. So if we take that information and lay it back on the top 10 from OWASP, or at least the ones that we need to worry about, um, we basically see that we can do a lot of code analysis and testing for all of these different things. Um, and uh, so that's you know, how I, I look at this. Um, the, the one exception, of course, is misconfiguration, so we need to do configuration, configuration analysis instead of code analysis. Um, for that, one big thing I'd recommend is the security review module, which is freely available on drupal.org, um, and it has output that you can send to Drush so that you can send it off to your Nagio system and trend analysis, uh, do some trend analysis on it. So how about responding to vulnerabilities? Um, I've broken this down in two different ways. And you know, if you have this problem yourself, um, you're just gonna, once you've identified the problem and need to fix it, you, know, you fix it, uh, test it, deploy the problem, and then potentially contact the customers. This is something that's increasingly important that uh, different government regulations, depending upon where you live, may force your, your site and your audience um, into, is that you need to let them know about whatever breach has happened. If you happen to find a problem in contributed code that's hosted on drupal.org, then you need to do those things probably, but you should also be working with the Drupal security team. Um, so you need to work with them to let them know about the problem. They can work with the module maintainer or the theme maintainer to um, help all of the other Drupal sites in the world. Uh, as Jam put it so pleasantly in the opening presentation, your fixed bugs are my fixed bugs. Um, and I think that's a really nice way that we can share fixes with each other. 
So how about detecting threats? Um, what kinds of things can we do? I think it's, you know, if you've got spam comments, spam nodes being posted into your site, that's usually pretty obvious, right? Um, but if it's a site that you don't visit often, then seeing monitoring about the number of nodes that are created on a site might give you some um, good clue about a site that's uh, suddenly under an attack of spam. A harder thing to track is if you're being used as a relay for spam that's going out because it's transient on your server. It's just going right through and you don't have as much evidence of the fact that that has happened. Um, so, you know, some solutions for that are, again, monitoring the number of emails being sent from your site. Uh, if you have defacement, you know, this is something that I think is interesting. Um, people will sometimes hide the fact that they've defaced your site. Um, so how about raise your hand if you've had your site hacked and you didn't see it, and then you looked in the Google cache of your site and saw that there were links for Viagra and things like that, right? I see a couple of hands. It's a surprisingly um, common problem, I think. Uh, it's pretty scary. So how can you avoid that? Um, I'll talk a little bit more about how to, how to do that in a minute. Um, so, oh, pardon me, right now. Um, so version control, I think, is a big way to do that. It's often in something like index.php that people are adding that code. And so if you've got index.php and version control, you can see, is there a diff here between what's in my repository and what's on my server? Um, that will let you know if there's been an attack on your server that modified the file that, of course, didn't make it back into a version control system. Um, or there's also the hacked module, which is a great tool for analyzing your site and comparing the version of code on your site to the version on Drupal.org. Um, the security review module has a feature where it will look through node bodies and comments for any sort of, for um, some kind of telltale signs of defacement. So it looks for JavaScript or PHP injection inside of those areas. And again, it's not necessarily that those are there that's a problem, but you should do some trend analysis on it to see, okay, I've got three nodes that have JavaScript in them, and they're all there because it's an embedded video or something like that. So if tomorrow I see that there are 20 nodes with embedded JavaScript in them, um, I should look into those and, and kind of see what's going on. Um, and then an you know, another great idea is uh, to just take a look at the revisions of different nodes. I think that's another place that people like to hide spam. They'll create a revision that has the spam in it um, and then look for, and then change it back so that uh, if the revision is publicly available, then that, that individual revision can be a source for spam. Quite tricky. Um, another way to hide the, or to identify these problems is just crowdsourcing it. Um, so on groups.drupal.org, we have an up-down capability that people can vote down on, on comments. Um, and in addition to allowing people to disagree with each other without taking the time to write a full comment, um, it's also really handy for identifying spam. Um, so by letting your audience vote down on things, you can find, things more, find those problems more easily. Um, two other tools related to specifically at the Drupal layer for looking at problems, PHP IDS and Tiny IDS. How many people have tried PHP IDS? And how many people are still running it for those who had their hands up? Okay, one person, that's good. Um, so one out of three still like it. Um, I, I tried this for a little while and found that it had too many false positives, um, but I think it's worth experimenting with. Um, Tiny IDS is a newer one. I actually haven't tried it. It was um, you know, just worked on a lot recently, and I think it's worth checking out. So let me know if you like it. Um, another interesting idea that's uh, you know, outside of the Drupal layer is some sort of a web application firewall. And there's lots of great commercial tools for this. Um, another one to consider is the mod security tool from Apache. Um, I, my, my sense is that they require a, a fair bit of configuration, um, and I would just like to fix the problems in Drupal itself. Um, but that's just my perspective. Um, so brute force password is another kind of a problem that people have to look for, um, and the security review module can help you out with that as well. Um, it's something that um, Drupal 7 now has protection against, so it's uh, hopefully less of a problem um, through a, a login delay if there's failed logins. Um, so you can also just like look at your watchdog logs all day long, right? Um, which of course we're doing, or you can use a tool like Dropdoor or any other monitoring solution for looking for those failed logins. So some tools to combat that. Um, I think some of the problems with spam, the tools for that are pretty well known. Um, Mala, Akismet, there's even the spam module inside of your site, um, or flag abuse, which is again the, the crowdsourcing solution. Um, if you have defacement, then uh, you know the, the, the resolution for defacement I think is just r trying to solve where the problem came from um, so that you're not hacked again, and then uh, restore from a known good copy of the site. Luckily with Drupal, we can usually just download the version of the code again from Drupal.org, and we know that that's going to be a good version, um, or knock on wood. Um, we're pretty sure that's gonna be a good version, right? Um, 
So, you know, take a look in the node revisions, use an old database backup, uh, go back to a known good version, and then apply that, you know, if you can, if you need to, copy and paste in new, um, new improvements to the content where necessary. Um, for, for code injection, altering your files, you know, I think that there's a couple different places to block this. As I mentioned, um, you know, revision control system is a great place to, to uh, monitor that and be able to have a, an idea of whether or not things have been changed. Um, and, you know, you just really need to keep, like, you kind of put all your eggs in one basket there and keep a really good eye on that basket. Um, another thing that you can do is look for attacks at the firewall level if you see somebody who is trying to modify that stuff and then block them there. Um, so brute force password I mentioned uh, just earlier that in Drupal 7 mostly been solved or there's the login security module for those of you still on Drupal 6 or earlier. Um, another interesting idea I think is the HTTP BL module. So how many people have tried that guy out? Yeah, just one person? How many people have gone to Drupal.org? Okay, so Drupal.org is running the HTTP BL module. Um, and uh, it seems to be working pretty well since none of you knew that it was. Uh, it's not doing too many false positives. Um, it, it will block, uh, it uses a kind of honeypot mechanism for identifying IPs that are exhibiting bad behavior and then block people who are identified via that honeypot mechanism. Um, so kind of an, an interesting idea. Um, another uh, side benefit of using HTTP BL is that it can reduce the um, crawlers and kind of spammers or um, spiders, pardon me, that are coming after your site that are acting in a malicious way. Um, and so it can reduce your resource consumption. So interesting thing to experiment with there. So I wanna talk a little bit more about some of the tools for site monitoring that are either internal to your site or external to your site. Uh, one great tool for monitoring is views, right? So a lot of monitoring is just creating lists of content. And if you're managing a relatively small number of sites, then this is a scalable solution to just create some administrative views that show you what's going on and you can inspect that. Um, particularly if you have a team of content moderators, you can give them some good administrative tools via the views module um, that will allow them to do their job more efficiently. Um, Mailmon, I put an asterisk on it because it's a brand new module as of last week. Um, I was thinking about that problem of Drupal sites sending out spam and said, hey, you know, we should have a way to keep track of that. Um, so I built this uh, tiny module. Um, I would love feedback from folks about it. Um, and then there's a couple of different charting tools. I think the charts make it a lot easier to ingest this information quickly at a glance. So uh, Quant, Report, and the Chart module all have some default charts that come along with them and are, um, generally speaking, extensible, so you can add in more charts to them. Um, there's also some external and uh, to usually paid systems that will help out with this. So uh, Acquia Network, you know, I've got to represent my company. I think that they've got a great tool in the Insight platform that helps with a lot of these tasks. Um, and then DropTor as well is a great solution. Um, they uh, monitor a slightly different set of things and present them in a different way. Um, it is uh, a much lower price point, but when you're comparing them, pardon me, it's not 24 per month, it's 24 per year. Um, when you're comparing those numbers, it's important to remember that the Acquia subscription comes with a lot of other things. So if you're just comparing on these two elements, it's not really, um, then, then you're gonna say, well, DropTor is a lot cheaper. Um, but Acquia has a lot more stuff. Um, DrupalMonitor.com, I actually didn't know about this until somebody tweeted it at me um, a couple days ago. So I have not had uh, any long-term experience with it. Um, but is anybody using Drupal Monitor, I guess? Yeah, one person? Two people? Great. Um, so they didn't, I didn't, couldn't find any information about pricing. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, I would love to learn more about that one as well. So here's a couple quick screenshots. Uh, this is a, a default set of charts that comes with, with the quant module. Um, again, useful for looking within your site, um, but not necessarily going across sites. So this is just taking a look at the amount of content, the amount of comments on the site. Uh, again, a high variation in those could lead to, uh, or could be an indicative of a new problem that's cropped up in your site. The report module provides, um, I think, um, an interface that was a little bit confusing to me at first. I had to poke around a little bit to get into it, but then it, it, was, it felt like it was pretty dense in the way that it presented information. Um, the chart module, I think, is pretty interesting. It's a general chart framework, and then there's a sub-module system chart, which provides some default charts that are pretty useful. Um, you know, it, it's using pie graphs here, but you could also use it with a couple of other, or you extend it to provide different views of the information. Um, on this particular site, there's not a lot going on. Um, so we have just a chart of one color. Everybody's active. Um, so here's DropTor, which I think is a pretty interesting option. They provide, again, a really dense pack of information about your site, and they try to present it in a way that you can manage a lot of sites at the same, inside of the same system. 
Um, it's a Drupal module and, and a third party service that work together. Um, so they'll give you, a, um, this was another interesting feature of it is that it'll show the amount of memory used on pages so that you can try to identify pages within your site that are memory hogs. Um, so it has you know, some monitoring purposes, some performance benefits, lots of different areas. Um, and then here again related to the memory is showing some trend information about the amount of memory used. And it has this overview checklist page that I think is pretty handy for saying like, okay, I'm gonna get my site into good shape. Um, this is particularly good if you're taking over a site for somebody else. You can install a tool like this and, and like make sure that it's up to snuff. Um, and then uh, you know this is where they give you a list of all of your sites so that you can drill down into it. So there's two different tools from Acquia that I think are interesting. Um, the Acquia dashboard, which provides trending over time of a lot of different elements, um, all this on the left, and then provides integration with a couple of different third-party providers like New Relic and Yada, so that you can see all that information in one dashboard. Another new tool that we um, launched in November and just recently improved last week, so if you haven't looked at it recently, definitely reconsider it. Um, also, 30-day free trial for Acquia Insight. Um, it tries to break down the status of your site as a single number. Um, so this particular site that uh, I was looking at was a 67%. And you could, it's, it's um, I think, pretty interesting to go through this and see, like, okay, I can spend an afternoon and take my number from 67 to a 90, um, or, you know, from one level to another. Um, and, you know, along the way, improving performance, improving security, um, and it feels like, um, I don't know, personally it gives me a, a sense of satisfaction that I know that I've made progress. Um, so when you're looking at those numbers, you can drill down into the specific sections, security, performance, um, and also, uh, let's see, the Veloci SEO grader is in incorporated into this. Um, right now, the security is looking at configuration checks, and I mentioned that uh, next quarter it will be improved with some more configuration checks, um, more advice about additional modules to add in, and an XSS scanner. Um, so one, one kind of overarching thought, I talked a lot about adding stuff into your site, and I just want to say that when you're adding stuff in, you have to be really conscious of what it is that you're adding and you know, making sure that just because it's a, a tool related to increasing the security or stability of your site, it's not guaranteed that that, problem, that um, addition won't have problems of its own. Um, so this, was, uh, this is uh, the security announcement about the Barracuda web application firewall that had a cross-site scripting vulnerability in it. Um, so Barracuda, a very famous company, you know, large enterprise-oriented organization, um, and, and yet by putting the Barracuda web application firewall in front of your system, you've now exposed yourself to cross-site scripting. Um, so keep that in mind and try to balance things as you're um, going for the buffet of open source modules that you can just add in. All right, Trent. Thanks, Greg. Um, you know, one of the things that, that's really interesting kind of about the space we live in is it's very launch focused, right? We get all, all ready and we have project plans about how we're gonna get to the point where we launch either an application or a site and we get monitoring in place and we do secure code review and we do the launch and we throw a big party and then we often hear crickets, right? That that, that is, we're done. We move on to some other project, we move on to some other site until a problem arises, usually until we have an incident. And then that day is not a very great day, right? We're like, holy cow, um, you know, we've exposed private data or our site was defaced or something like that. And so folks often ask, what are the things that I need to be doing after launch to make sure that on an ongoing basis my site is secure and operating well? And so let's, let's spend a few minutes thinking about that. Um, it, it, it really, boils down to these four points at some level. Um, first is maintaining eternal vigilance. Um, we want to automate that as much as possible. We want to be using an automated monitoring system or service. Um, uh, but we also have to be aware what state is our site in? Um, how is it being monitored? How is it performing? What does it look like on a good day? We'll talk about how to do that a little bit in a bit. Um, we do want to automate as much as possible so we don't have a human error factor. And human errors comes in lots of different forms, but um, particularly what we see when it comes to ongoing operational uh, maintenance of a site is human error often uh, comes in the form of, I was too busy to get to this set of tasks, right? Yes, I knew that we were supposed to do patching. Yes, I knew that I should have been monitoring disk space to make sure it wasn't full, but you know, I had a hundred other things going on and I didn't get to it. And so the more that we can automate that so that it doesn't fall off the list is always a good plan. 
Um, we need to do periodic auditing. I'll talk about that in some level of detail. And then, of course, the, um, all the catch-all of just not sleeping, um, working 24 hours a day will, uh, will fix it. Um, when, when folks look at the list of stuff that we have to do, and, and I actually added at the end of this talk a kind of a pledge that we can all take of, of all the things that we're going to do so that our sites are in awesome shape. Um, when we look at all the things you have to do, sometimes it gets overwhelming. You're like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe that um, if, if I run Drupal, then I have to do X, Y, Z, K, and, and Q. Well, let's maybe just step back for a minute and think about, well, is it do those things and do them right, or could we see how some other platform does it? So I thought it might be fun to just kind of compare Drupal to other platforms for a moment in a, a couple different areas. Um, so let, let's take a, a, a case of the, the, the Twitter module um, um, available for another platform like WordPress, and of course we have a Twitter module for Drupal. Um, what, you'll, what you'll notice here is that um, there is a page for it, and it's got some information that talks about its features, but we see very little data on you know, what things are going well with this module, um, what things aren't going well with this module, um, what things have been fixed, um, th that type of thing. If we compare that to the information that is available on Drupal.org um, for the Twitter, Twitter module, you will see we have an incredible amount of data at our fingertips that can help us select a module to begin with, that can help us maintain it. We, we know how many issues there are. The Drupal community is very open about not only sharing code, but sharing here's deficiencies that you could help with, or here's bugs that need to be fixed, um, or here's a workaround to make, to, to make something work, you know, even if it's not uh, working perfectly. We also get good data about how many um, sites are reporting that they're using a particular module. Why is that interesting? Is it helps us pick modules that are going to be operationally supportable. Um, that we know uh, a lot of other sites are using and reporting bugs on and fixing, that type of thing. Um, so yes, do we have to do maintenance on modules and we have to pick modules strategically? Absolutely. But Drupal in particular gives us a good um, uh, basis for doing that in an intelligent way. We're not just throwing darts at a wall. What about coding guidelines? Uh, the WordPress coding guidelines, um, uh, this, wow, this text is probably way too small to read, especially in the back. Um, but I'll, I'll give you um, just some highlights, right? Um, th this page is primarily focused on things like, well, you should have a firewall and, and, and um, you should run a current version of your operating system and so on. Um, it's, it's very, what I would call hand wavy. Um, in contrast, um, the, the Drupal coding standards are very crisp and clear. You need to do these things. You need to avoid to do these other things. Here is our coding standards as a community. That allows us to, to harden the platform together and make sure that, that it works well in an operational environment. Just a couple more comparison examples. Um, security announcements. Um, the uh, WordPress security announcement stuff, um, there is no way that you could concretely say, I am running a WordPress site and I know it to be secure based on their announcement stream. In contrast, um, the, the Drupal security team does just an outstanding A-plus job of giving very detailed, timely announcements and fixes and um, uh, quantifying and describing the risk that's involved. So you can say, well, this vulnerability um, is going to affect my production site, um, and it is so critical that I have to take it down and I have to patch it today. Or this is an issue that you know, I can deal with during our normal maintenance window in a couple weeks. Those guys do a, uh, uh, a, a great job. Finally, yes, <laughs> Drupal security team. This is, though, probably my strongest um, when it comes from operating and, and choosing a platform. Uh, uh, my strongest argument is around module maintenance. If you are living in the WordPress world or one of the many other um, open source CMSs, Almost all of them, they have a, you know, some type of central way to uh, describe that modules exist. But if you have a problem with a module or there's a security vulnerability in a module, what they do is they refer you back to the module maintainer, which may or may not be aware of the issues or how it interacts with others or whatever. Um, Drupal, as Greg um, uh, talked about, um, all of this is centralized. So 
Uh, if there is a, a known security problem, the Drupal security team is going to address that and work with the module maintainer, and then all of that information is available on drupal.org in one central place. Makes our operational lives much easier. Um, finally, and Greg mentioned this, but I want to highlight this, is uh, Drupal core. Um, this is straight off of drupal.org, and I've, I've added the little red um, highlighting box, um, is that when we talk about site operations and, and security, it is incredibly critical that we are all running the same core code so that if there is a vulnerability, we can get a fix quickly, um, so that we, we aren't introducing vulnerabilities. Core is, is uh, an area that is, is just not intended to be customized. Um, for those of you who can't read it in the back, this, this is a page that says, do not hack core, and the box says, um, are there exceptions to this rule? Nope. We should be using the very extensible framework that Drupal provides us to do any type of customization. That's going to help us with operational security, performance, and availability going forward. You guys, as site administrators and as just general Drupal advocates, need to be communicating this with, with everyone who touches the site, really. Let's talk about periodic audit. Um, also too small to read in the back. Um, uh, but this is available, um, uh, this presentation of course will be available, but um, uh, if you drop me an email, um, I will also um, send you a PDF of this. But what this is, is this is um, just a, a stab at, here's a periodic audit program. Um, what are the things that um, I should be auditing quarterly around paths of attack? Um, what, are, what are the things that I should be doing um, annually for network security ar architecture or, or um, uh, quarterly for encryption usage and log handling uh, and key handling and so on. So it gives us a, a checklist of here's what we should be doing every week, every month, every quarter, every year to assess the security of our infrastructure and our Drupal sites to make sure that they're in good shape. You don't have to use all of these, but my hope is that you'll look at through this list and it'll spark ideas. Yes, these are things that we should be doing for our site. These things don't matter because whatever, we don't handle sensitive data, um, or we don't have that type of infra infrastructure, that type of thing. So um, either grab these out or grab this whole list out of the um, slides or drop me an email and, and I'll send you a PDF of it. One of the things that I think is especially difficult to convey, especially to non-IT people, when it comes to operational management and security of sites is that we have to build a strong chain from top to bottom. And, and I've tried to illustrate this here. Um, Way down at the bottom in the green box, I've tried to illustrate all users. We need all of our users, even if it's users that are fairly non-technical, to have some level of security awareness, right? We need to educate them on how to choose a good password and not sharing their accounts. And if someone calls them and says, you know, hi, uh, I'm from IT, um, uh, can you share your password with me? Hopefully they say no. Um, unfortunately, if we don't educate users about that, then they don't know how to handle those situations, and they end up being a weak link in the chain. And we can have done all of this great secure code review and monitoring and, and periodic auditing, and it will be all for naught if we have users that, that end up being the weak link in the chain. Um, uh, we expect that our, on the top side of this, the, the gray box, is that we're training all of our IT security um, specialists and professionals about the technologies that we're using. So this is where we kind of flip the table on this, is that yes, in many organizations, we have folks that are familiar with IT operations or IT security, and they're really good at their jobs, but they don't know specifics about Drupal. And so that's an opportunity where we, as a community and as advocates for the platform, have to go to them and say, look, here are the things you need to be aware of. Here's the Drupal security team. Here's their um, stream of vulnerability announcements you should be monitoring. Um, here's how the system is architected. Um, and then when we, when we look at the kind of the, 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 the middle layers um, for all of our, what, what should we call them, our I, IT administrators, folks that manage our infrastructure and manage our content and so on, that we want to give them a structure um, where they can operate in a secure way. And, and oftentimes that's a life cycle. Um, uh, on this blue square, it's, it says assess, plan, implement, operate, and monitor. We need to teach them all about these operational steps that we're going to follow. Um, from the top to the bottom of that, the unfortunate problem or challenge that we have is that 
I cannot give you a technology tool, I cannot give you a piece of software that solves all of this. And so in addition to doing all these great things that, that, that Ned and Greg talked about, um, and writing great code and all those things, we have to deal with the softer side of this in order to have ongoing secure operations of our site. We've got to do training, we've got to do awareness, we've got to do education top to bottom. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight is patching. Um, perhaps it's obvious, and I hope all of you guys are patching, um, but the, the reality is, is that every day new vulnerabilities are discovered, new patches are um, uh, out there, new methods of attacks are, are developed. And so for that reason, we have to continually evolve a site. Again, I started talking about this launch mentality. I have run across a lot of organizations that they launch their site, they let it sit, and you know, whatever, it, it, it launched as a, a, a Drupal 5 site a couple years ago, and today there it sits, unpatched, untouched. And that's just not, that does not work. That does not work with commercial software, and that does not work with open source software. Um, so we need to make sure that we have a plan for dealing with that. Um, uh, for instance, the standards, Ned talked about us evolving um, from the smokestack world, is now we see standards like PCI DSS telling us that um, we have to apply critical patches within 30 days. So that bounds the window. Um, I would suggest that, especially in today's world, if you have a truly critical patch, probably should be applied in a much shorter window, more like 72 hours. Almost done, a um, couple more slides. Um, one of the things that um, we're gonna talk about in this pledge in a minute is we need to have an incident management plan or incident response plan. Is that, I would like to say, none of you will ever have to experience a breach or an incident. Um, and knock on wood, that will never happen. If it does, what you guys need to have in place is a documented plan that, that has something like this. You can you could write it on one piece of paper or you can Google for it and find you know 50 page examples, but basically boils down to some type of response, some plan for around notification and escalation. And the, the, the tip there is, is that we wanna keep the notification to the smallest possible group as long as possible. So we really know what happened and we know how we're gonna fix it. And then we can figure out what's the appropriate communication to the larger organization or to the outside world. And then, you know, what is our, our long-term response strategy? Do we need to upgrade a module or, or um, do we need to go notify users that their data was disclosed, something like that? Um, important takeaway, um, I've had people go, duh, um, on this, is as site administrators, sometimes I think we're lazy and we use the same password. Um, this is not an effective security strategy. There have been many examples in the news of this recently, including the fine folks at um, the PlayStation Network, um, is that you know one thing that you can do as a privileged administrator to increase security of all the sites you manage is just simply choose a different password between them so that if one site gets compromised, all of the sites or instances aren't also compromised. All right, finally, we're down to the last three slides, guys. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, I threw this together. Hopefully this is kind of a summary of all the things that we've talked about today, but let's go through them just one bullet at a time really quick. This is what I'm hoping all of you guys as, as uh, Drupal site administrators and site builders um, uh, can pledge to. I pledge to do the following. I'll set a unique strong password for any accounts with administrative privileges, and I do not share passwords ac across multiple sites. We can all do that. I use multi-factor authentication, often in the form of something like SSH keys, for OS level, operating system level access, and have password only access disabled on my system. So if, like, if you're maintaining the operating system layer like Linux, you have a, a, a key system in place rather than just a password. Um, it's free and easy to do. Um, I have an execute a patching plan that includes the operating system, web server, and Drupal layers, including core modules and custom code, right? I have to patch all of those. If I've developed custom code, I have to have a plan to evaluate and evolve it going forward. I have an execute at least a minimalist periodic audit plan. That's a slide that you couldn't read that said, well, we need to do the following quarterly and the following annually. Whatever's right for you guys, maybe you just do an annual audit on stuff. I hope you're auditing some items more frequently, but you need to have some plan for that. Um, I am aware of and comply with applicable information security requirements for the data that my site handles. So if you handle healthcare information, you need to comply with HIPAA. If you handle credit cards, you need to comply with PCI DSS, so on and so forth. You need to be aware of what those standards are and, and make sure you're in compliance. I monitor vulnerability announcement mailing lists for the technologies I use on my site. That's the simplest way to find vulnerabilities. Just read the email. 
Um, I monitor my system regularly such that I know how it behaves under normal conditions. Why do we need to do that? So that on a bad day, when someone says, the site's really slow, you know, is it that that person didn't have their coffee in the morning, or is it truly that there's something wrong, and that's an indicator that we need to go investigate? I have a documented incident handling plan that I am familiar with and can use in an emergency. We talked about the need for that. Even if it's just one page, you should have something that when that moment of panic sets in, you can pull out of your desk drawer and say, this is what I'm going to follow to get me through the next few hours. Um, I take responsibility for ensuring that any custom code is developed according to the secure coding best practices and is evaluated before being put into production. If we're going to write custom code, it probably needs to be carefully reviewed before it's used on a production site. I will be eternally vigilant and investigate any unusual or suspicious site behaviors. I know we have all done this. I have done this. We're like, wow, that, did, that page didn't look right, but I'll, I'll come back to it another day. Sure enough, that was a telltale sign for a much larger problem. I have a process in place to ensure non-production sites are appropriately protected from external access or crawling. Um, you know, maybe that's a special robots.txt file or a packet filter, whatever, whatever you use in front of that. Um, and finally, I'm an advocate for practical information security practices, like the ones we've talked about today, but avoid security theater showmanship, right? We're not trying to scare people. We're trying to say these are the practical things that we need to do and leave it at that. Um, I'll just mention any of those of you who took a plane to Denver, you probably experienced a lot of security theater. Um, getting here. All right. That's it. Thank you guys so much um, um, for spending the last hour with us and talking a little bit about some of these operational issues. Um, we love to do this. As Ned said, this is the stuff that we find fun. So please contact us if you have questions or suggestions um, or, or ideas. Um, there are all of our email addresses. Um, and um, just to wrap up, we love feedback. Um, there's a survey that you can uh, fill out about this session. We'd love for you to spend five minutes just clicking through some buttons and giving us a little feedback about what we can do better. Um, finally, this is the last session in this room tonight, and so the, the, the facilities management folks have asked if you guys, as you leave, could just please look around if there's trash or um, someone left their cell phone or something, um, grab it um, and, and get it to this uh, uh, fine lady in the red shirt who will help you with that. Thank you guys so much for coming. Have a great night.